Welcome to the Win Make Give Podcast, Season 4. Chad Himes here, Bob Stewart there. Bob, how are you doing today? Uh, Chad, I'm really good, man. I'm, I'm feeling professional. Ooh, nice segue. We're not even there yet. You know, Bob, I, I have an issue. I have an issue with you. Um, okay. <laughs> it's oh, been three go. seasons. Uh, I'm finally going to address this issue with you here in <laughs> okay. Season 4. Okay. Okay. When we have a guest, you always do a little bit of research on the guest. And you show up wearing a hat for the guest. I, yes, I used to do that more than I have recently. Is that your issue with me? Yeah. Uh, my issue is not that you do that for them. Oh. <laughs> Come on, Bob. I just get well, the generic hat. Chad, I will tell you because like this may key some people in on when we recorded this. My team just kicked a snot out of your team so if there was any day i would show up wearing your team's hat i probably should have done it today because they're like you know the stink would have been on that hat still but yes um (laughs) bob let's just be really clear yes they are my team and i will stand by them uh this is the season we will be wearing the brown paper bags over (laughs) our heads i think Uh, i saw one of those on on monday night football uh wait who are your other teams then chad we got the giants so maybe i have a a hat for one of your other teams that i could wear next the other mostly home teams right the blue jays toronto blue jays for me uh and the the maple leafs although the hat you probably have in your collection bob is i have taken on because we were living there when they were born uh and that is kraken support oh okay absolutely man i got a kraken hat i probably got one right here around my desk somewhere there you go. Or, or you can get a Spartan hat. We can get you a Spartan I think hat. I have a Blue Jays hat. I, I think okay. up there in the closet is a Toronto Blue Jays hat. So maybe I'll, I'll break that bad boy out for you next time. They got. Cool I'm hat. offended. Uh, it's been three years before I finally had the courage to bring this one to your attention. <laughs> or three seasons. Right. It's been All more right. than three years. Noted. Uh, Noted. Fix that. All right. So we're talking about professionals right here we're talking about professional sports you joked at the beginning that you're feeling all professional and stuff today what is it about professionals bob that we're going to talk about for everybody well so uh, let me set the stage here for a second because and i want to give credit to brian gubernick our, our, our friend brian i heard so i was out with him um kind of talking to a group of our partners recently and he brought up so I'll just he asked the crowd right so there's you know there's a hundred people there sitting with us and he said how who in the room played college sports? And, and a few people raised their hand, and, and he zeroed in on one lady. She had played um, college soccer. Okay. And so he asked her, he said, hey, um, how much film did you watch as an amateur athlete in you know, playing perf- uh, college soccer? And she, she was like, every day. Like, we watch film every day. And she said, he said, well, what about in high school? When you were in high school, did your soccer team watch film? And she's like, yep, we watch film like twice a week. And then he turned to the audience and he said, how many of you guys have watched any film of yourself performing in your job? And and understand, these are like sales people, Chad, right? Uh, And, you know, you listen to enough of our podcast, you know that we do a lot in the real estate industry. It's like real estate sales individuals so he's asking him like have you ever recorded like your listing presentation for example and then gone back and like analyzed and watched it to see how you could improve and there was you know in a room of 100 i think there were two people that raised their hand that said they'd ever recorded themselves doing kind of their primary professional job and it i mean it just really sunk in with me i was like oh my gosh yeah like holy cow I even hate to listen to my voice on tape, Chad, right? Or, or Bob, I hate listening to your voice too. I know, right? I know. And so it's hard to go back. And I've gotten used to over the years going back and listening to things that I've done before and, and iterating on improvement, especially if they're like presentations that I know I'm going to do again and again. Yep. So I, I guess all of that to set up, we wanted to, to talk today, Chad, about some things that professionals do different than an amateur. And, and so that's going to be our topic. And, and again, inspired by Brian's just kind of gut punch to that group of 100 people, you know, a, 98 of which had never kind of gone that extra step to really hone their craft. That is a great, great uh, question, Brian. I'll probably steal that one uh, for some people because, yeah, that is a gut punch for all of us. I remember listening I've used to it everybody. four times already, Chad. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Good. Uh, and I'm sure Brian stole it from someone else as well along the way. Uh, I, I remember listening to the early episodes of Win Make Give, taking notes even, 
like, oh, we cut each other off or, oh, we spoke over each other too much or, oh, one person was talking for too long, whatever it was uh, before we've now gotten here where I think we've got this down to a pretty good system and model. Uh, you know, it's funny because be- even in those early days when we would sit in the room together, like we had devised a couple hand signals where Ben would like hand signal us or he'd kind of cue us up next that, that he was coming to us for a question. And so even that kind of stuff of just the consistency of showing up and doing it, you start to get a little bit better at, at it, right? And hey, I think Bob, don't give away our signals. Okay, okay right? sorry. <laughs> you know, they don't know that the nose is the indicator. I don't want the third base coach to let everyone know what's going on. All right. Uh, and Brian, before we move on to the list, Brian is the host of the No Days Off podcast. Uh, such a great, so yeah, great, great podcast. If uh, you are a listener of Win, Make, Give, you really should be checking out as part of the Win, Make, Give network, we host Brian Gubernick's no days off every day of the week. He's bringing you a short lesson uh, to be learned. Check out his podcast and get caught. By the way, up. that was not that we didn't set this up. That that was a natural segue to a plug for Brian and, and no days off. Well, it's what I do. It's yeah. what I do. All right. So, Bob, let's get into this list. We, we looked at this list we had. We, we both brought some stuff. We generated this list together. Uh, we realized that a few of the things you had and a few of the things I had were kind of similar. We cut the list down. Um, we agreed to keep one in <laughs> only because it would have made the list 10, and, and mm-hmm. I can't have that. right? Yeah. I can't have right. top 10. David Letterman will probably sue us if we did a top 10 list. Right. So We're going to bring you folks here 11 things professionals do differently than amateurs. You know what's funny is there's some people listening to this that have no idea who David Letterman or his top 10 is. Like, there's got to be, right? Some 20-year-olds out here listening to Windmaker. All right, like, Facebook what? post. It's in the post. <laughs> Do you know who David Letterman was, right? Because well, he's back with that beard and all that. Yeah. Do you Are you pro older Letterman, 80s Letterman, or are you current Letterman? And did you have a favorite top 10 list or gag that they did on the show? It'll be in the Facebook group. Join us in the Win, Make, Give Facebook group. Bob, number one on the list. Uh, Amateurs stop when they achieve something. Professionals understand that initial achievement is just the beginning. Ah, yes. Amateurs are, I did it. It's done. I'm complete. I'm happy now. Professionals are like, no, that's step one. This was on a journey that we've got in front of us. Yes? Yeah. I, (laughs) I think back to, and I tell this joke all the time in our business, um, we used to run a real estate brokerage in Washington state here in like the two thousands. And you would, you would have these, these individuals that would get like a commission, sometimes their first commission. And it would be a, a paycheck, Chad, that would tend to be of a size they've probably never seen before. Right. $12,000, $14,000, something like that. And, you know, and then you wouldn't see them again for two or three months. Right. It was like, they achievement, the first closing, they're celebrating. And, and you know, professionals understand, like, okay, that's where I'm just getting started. Like I gotta build. So I mean, yeah, like the the over celebration of of like that that milestone when you you know a professional realizes, like, especially if I'm on this thing for the long journey, that's that's one small step in what's probably gonna be a you know, many more steps. Yeah, and I would bet almost every professional, I don't care what you're a professional in you have certain things you remember yet you don't remember them all and you don't even remember them in the proper order, right? A a baseball player will remember his first hit. He'll probably remember his first home run, but he won't remember that day he went four for four. It'll just kind of get lost in there. That doctor might remember the first, you know, heart surgery he did. And he might remember the one because it was on someone and it was a really unique situation, but they won't remember every certain, Amateurs, yeah, they remember them because they just have them and then they're gone, as you said. Where and they don't have as many of them, right? Part of that professional is is just the longevity of of showing up to their craft. And over time, you have lots of those those wins, right? No one probably sticks out more than like those that first one, maybe. Yeah, and then there's that big one, right? That grand slam that won the World Series. You'll remember that one, uh, Bob. I think that almost segued us perfectly into number two uh, on this list, which is amateurs have a goal. Professionals have a process, mm. right? So almost that same thing you're saying. They have a goal to to sell a house in real estate, to accomplish X, right? Make that dish, whatever it is, if they're an amateur chef or something like that, where a professional knows, no, it's just a process. I'm going to make that pasta 
for the next thousand nights What's until the, I get it perfect. Ben, I think Ben, he used, I think it's a Gary Keller quote that's like, oh, by the way, you got that, huh? Yeah, we, we, we all got our national alert. Yeah, so now they know exactly what time we're recording this out on what day. Um, but Ben Ben uses that that quote from Gary that's like, goals without a plan are just dreams or something like that. Yeah, right? there's many a people have said that one, yes. So to me, that's like amateurs have this goal, but like professionals understand there's a plan and a process that actually gets you to that goal. I think the other thing about that is like, Amateurs have a goal, and if they're not going to hit it, there's no adjustment to what they're going to do to get to it. And a professional says, look, here's the process that I'm going to use to get to that goal, and I'll be damned. I'm halfway there, and the, the process is not seeming to get me to the goal that I'm after. I need to adjust or double down on the process to, to, to get to that goal. So I love that. It's just a mindset thing, but to me, how am I going to get to that goal? Not, not just that I have one. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's nothing more to say to that. You nailed that one, you know, knocked it out of the park if I keep using the baseball analogy. There he goes. There he goes. All right, number three, Bob, give it to us. Amateurs see feedback and coaching as someone criticizing them personally. Uh, professionals know they have weak spots and they'll actually seek out thoughtful criticism. Chad, I mean, this is right up your alley, right? You coach a lot of professionals. And the reality is, I think if you were being honest with us, you probably coach some amateurs too, yes. right? And look, they're looking to become professionals. It's one of the reasons they've engaged a coach. I don't know of any professional athletes, at least, that don't have a coach or any professional musicians or most of those people have have coaches, right? So um, I don't know. You, you, do you see that? Like in some of your early coaching sessions, do you have to work through those things where people feel like you're attacking them personally? You know, I'll keep the name out sure. of the story to protect. But they're listening. The they know who they are. <laughs> Maybe they might. If they're listening, they might know that it was them. That uh, they joined coaching with me, and within two or three weeks, quit because you know. I mean, when I finally got the answer out of them why they quit, they were like, "Well, all you do is attack me. All you do is criticize. All you do is tell me I'm doing this wrong or I did that wrong or I'm." which I've never said the word wrong on a coaching call with somebody to my knowledge. Uh, and Bob, six months later, they reached back out to me and they said, would you be willing to take me back as a coaching client? And they came and we had a conversation to see if I'd be willing to take them back on as a coaching client. And what they had done is they had basically realized number three, yeah. right? And they had said, look, when I was where I was, I only got into coaching with you because someone I highly respect said I should be in coaching with you. I clearly wasn't ready for it. I was, and they didn't know to use the word, I was an amateur, right? Now I've done this and I've done that and I've done this other thing. And I understand that I have things I just don't see and I need a coach to help me discover those things, find those things, find the way through those things. And now they realize and, and they crave it when we get on the call, I haven't changed. Right. They have changed and they went from that college player or even high school player. They went to the pros where now they could handle what the coach was saying because they understood it might sound mean, yet it was coming from a place of support and criticism, not from an attack and criticizing. Yeah. Thoughtful criticism. Well, yes. All right. Number number four. Number four, yes. Number I don't four. Think the numbers here. Chad's the number keeper guy. All right. Uh, amateurs value isolated performance. Think about like you know the the receiver that catches that one difficult pass or something, right? Like, oh wow, I caught that one pass. Professionals value consistency. Chad, like, can I can I make that catch nine out of ten times, ten out of ten times? Um, you know, I, I you can go back to the Kobe Bryant's or the Steph Curry's. These guys will go out there and. You know, they're shooting 100 free throws in a row. They're making 100 free throws in a row, right? It's not about the fact they can, they can make that one long three-pointer. It's, it's the consistency of being able to do their thing at a high level over and over and over and over again. Yeah, an amateur, I mean, I'll, I'll go back to my team since we've already beat up on the Giants. If you go back in history, you will, I mean, anybody who's a football fan will remember the Odell Beckham Jr. catch. Oh, yeah. right? I remember the helmet, catch, the, that one-handed catch as, he, as he's falling out of bounds and catches the ball, right? He can't do that again and again. But here's the thing. He is a professional. He actually practices that. Yeah. 
right? He practices that one-handed catch while falling out. I mean, now it's almost commonplace in the NFL. It seems they're making every week someone's doing that because he's a professional. He says, I want consistency. Now, even though that catch is a one out of a hundred time catch, he still works on being consistent so he can attempt to get it. Right. Chad, I think I think about like when I read this, I think about again, it's in our sales world, people that like burst in for a day and do a whole bunch of activity and then high five themselves that they made a hundred phone calls today versus like that professional that shows up every day and makes 50 day after day after day after day after day. Right. And yep. the, the professional realizes it's, it's that consistency that's going to make them a winner. The amateur might get a win when they come in that one day to do a hundred, but there's a lot of other days they come in and, and burst in and do a flurry of activity and don't get a win. It's the consistency that gets, you know, more wins over time. Yeah. Put me on the free throw line, Bob. If that ball goes in, I might get that, win because i'm completely an amateur you can be sure the next 12 are not going anywhere near uh the net when it comes to it okay uh next we've got number five amateurs give up at the first sign of trouble because they just figure they're a failure professionals see failure as part of the path of growth as they master something right amateurs i strike out it's the kid who throws the bat on the ground gives up playing baseball, walks away, never going to do it again because he had that that opportunity. I'm sure your boys have had that at their age when they get to the, the right. And it's we have to show them that as professionals see, hey, let's learn from what we did wrong there so that we can get better and better. You know, and then we bring out all the statistics, right? Tony Gwynn, one of the greatest hitters, still got out four out of every 10 times. I so. love baseball. Like I, the, the thing I love the most about my son's playing baseball is it teaches failure. <laughs> like oh, exactly. you said, Tony Gwynn, Hall of Famer, got out. Six out of ten times. He was out. A half or seven out of ten times. Yeah, so like baseball really teaches failure and how to get back up from it. And, and two innings later, I got to step back into the box again after I just failed and struck out in front of every fan in the building. Like, yeah, but, but you know, as a professional, those, they're looking at my son is 16. He's not a professional, but he's he's getting into that mindset of it, right? Because he has to show back up two innings later. Yeah. Bob, before we go on uh, and even dive more into that total, right? Do you think the way you just said that of baseball really being a game of failure, um, do you think that's the reason baseball is no longer America's sport, whereas football is because football isn't about failing that often you don't miss that many kicks the players actually catch more passes than than they probably mm. don't and things like that it's a you think fascinating that's question with it? i mean it's or is it just the fact that baseball's slow as molasses and i love that sport uh, and football's fast paced and people hit each other i mean i think it's probably a little bit of both chad like just as a society i think that we're more you know I today, we don't our, realize it. yeah we don't realize it our brains are more in tune with like that quick you know get me the next article scroll swipe so football is a little bit more in tune with probably how most of our brains are are being wired these days. But I would also say that, yeah, like I think just if if in the, the conscious of America, we're less likely to, to have that resiliency, right? Like as we're raising kids and, and bulldoze our parents and taking all of the obstacles out of their way, like does that make the failures of baseball less attractive? Probably psychologically. Yeah, I just, you know, we probably don't even realize that that's one of the reasons we're, we're banishing baseball to a second class sport almost in that regard so all right well there you go that's just a side note here all right so I agree absolutely we have to if we think we're a professional we have to agree that failure is just the growth i mean bob please audience please don't do this right if still scroll back we leave our failures for you to see listen to the first five episodes of win make give at least i mean oh my gosh right disasters um <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to how far we have progressed and, and gotten moved along on this. All right, let's keep going on our list, Bob. Number six amateurs, is... Amateurs don't have any idea of what improves the odds of achieving positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. Professionals do, right? Like they know their metrics. They know those levers in their business that if they go pull on those levers, the results will come out of it. They probably track those things right like you know ben talks about a lack of accounting leading to a lack of accountability i, I right. don't know by the way if on our list we have like 
amateurs dodge accountability professionals you know like clamor for it it probably falls into this bucket right here this bucket of like i don't really know what's leading to the successes in my business or i'm not willing to 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 do those things consistently back to the last one right yeah amateurs throw that that you know figurative bowl of spaghetti at the wall and hope something sticks mm. and that they have a success for it and then they have no idea why that strand stuck Whereas the professional knows exactly, oh, I'm going to throw this bowl of spaghetti at the wall and I'm going to tell you these seven are going to stick and this is why they're going to stick and they're going to know it. Uh, so folks, take a look at yourself. If you consider yourself a professional, do you know what it is that's improving your odds? And do you know that it's, oh, well, if I make another phone call, that's going to improve my odds of success. Or if I do that one more burpee, it's going to improve my odds of success here. Or if I spend those five more minutes doing this, it's going to improve my odds of success being a parent, whatever that is, become a professional. Amateurs are all over the place with that. All right, number seven, Bob, and I, we went over the list. There were a few that kind of could go together. This was one that I circled and said, it's staying on our list when we put it together. And it's because I, this has been a, something I've been teaching for a decade to people. And I just love when other people say it because sometimes they just don't hear it from me anymore. Right. And that's amateurs focus on identifying their weaknesses and fixing them. Whereas professionals focus on their strengths to develop and find others so they can leverage their weaknesses away. Ooh. Right. We all have strengths. We all have weaknesses. There is no one listening to this podcast that doesn't have something that's their strength and doesn't have something that's a weakness. My desk is a disaster if, if I pan the camera around, right? I am a disorganized, well, I shouldn't say disorganized because I know exactly what's in every pile, but I am <laughs> a cluttered mess of person. My wife, on the other hand, that is a strength of hers. So she comes through and cleans the whole house and reorganizes things and Yells at me, of course, for being the tornado that I am and just leaving things in all these piles. But she has that strength, right? There are people out there that we know, again, if we use the, the analogy of sports that we're talking about, the coach sends a certain pitcher in in a certain situation because that pitcher's strength is going to be to get out this guy who's coming up to bat, mm. right? Or we're going to run the ball because our strength in this situation is give the ball to the running back. No one can stop him, whatever that's going to be. Amateurs, they just say, oh, I'm not good at this. Let me put all my effort into getting better at it. And John Maxwell is the one that I always talk about when I talk about this. He has said on a scale of one to 10, rate yourself on your strengths, rate yourself on your weaknesses. If it's not a three or below, it's not really a weakness. So be honest on this scale. It's got to be an eight or higher to be a strength. And the most you'll ever do, no matter how much work you put into it, Bob, is you'll add three. So understand that if it's an 8, a 9, or a 10, you're going to be a 10, a 10, a 10 on your strengths if you focus and develop. If you fix your weaknesses, at most, you'll become a 4, 5, 6, which is just average. So instead, go leverage it to someone who can do it better than you because they're an 8, 9, or a 10, and stop worrying about the 1, 2, 3, and go do your 8, 9, 10s. Yeah. Yeah, love it. All right, All right. number 8, Chad. Like, I, I've... Like probably in my marriage, been an amateur in this regard. <laughs> in my professional career, been an amateur in this regard, right? Uh, number eight is amateurs focus on being right. And yes. professionals focus on getting the best outcome. It, you know, sometimes um, regardless of, of being right or, or, you know, in the face of being right. Um, I just, I, I don't know what else to say. on that. <laughs> I've been guilty of this a, a lot in my life. Oh, yeah. And anybody, again, who says they're not, baloney, right? Maybe you're better at it now. And Bob, as, as we become professionals, because yes, we're still becoming professionals in certain areas. There are still areas in my life I'm an amateur, right? There are areas, and that's what our audience get that. Profession, you can be a, I'm an amateur gardener, right? I'm, I'm about getting it right, not about getting the best outcome. I'm like, no, it's supposed to do this, right? But okay, <laughs> so don't let me near the garden is what you should learn. I'm not a professional gardener. Be a professional in the things that matter to you, and then you'll quickly learn, as you just said, Bob, amateurs focus on being right. How many of us are amateur husbands or amateur yeah. wives or whatever that is? 
because we're always focused on being right. I mean, sometimes I'm an, a, a, I mean, I try real hard to be a professional parent, and I don't even know what that means necessarily, right? But I, I'm I'm an amateur parent sometimes. Sometimes yeah. I, I just want to be right, and if I was to step back, and my wife helps me do this often, I'm like that doesn't matter necessarily. <laughs> well, Most either of you time. remember this in a month, much less it it do it, just let the kid have it, and yes, the sky is blue because whatever reason they want it to be right now. Okay. Right. Number nine, amateurs think good outcomes are the result of their brilliance. Mm. Whereas professionals understand when outcomes are actually the result of luck. Bob, yeah. what do you think about that? Well, I, I, yeah, totally agree. Like, look, there's, Ben's got this whole, I don't know if we've done this episode. He's got this whole like talk about luck, like the different types of luck and what professionals end up with is they become more lucky because they're more prepared to engage those situations that ultimately are sure they're luck. They happen because of luck, but they were able to capitalize on that opportunity because they were prepared, Chad. Right. Yeah. And amateurs, you know, like what's the, you know, what a blind squirrel finds a nut or a broken clocks right twice a day. Like as an amateur, you still stumble into things potentially that, you know, are great outcomes, but you know, highly likely it was just the fact that you ran into the nut, not that you were prepared for that, that thing. Right. And so, yeah, look, when you start to credit those things to your brilliance, I think you do it at the detriment of preparing yourself Chad, for the next time that similar type of luck might come along that you're you can capitalize on it. And so if yeah. you're not, you know, if you think, oh, I'm brilliant, that, that happened to me because of my brilliance, I'm not trying to improve myself. I'm not trying to, you know, be in a position to, to more better capitalize on luck later. Yes. Thomas Jefferson said it very well. I'm a great believer in luck. And I find the harder I work, the more of it I have. Mm. Right. Yeah. And Oprah always said, I believe luck is preparation meeting opportunity. If you hadn't been prepared when the opportunity came along, you wouldn't have been lucky, right? How many times did a situation occur that we missed an opportunity that we would have described as, oh, it was just luck, right? Because we were prepared, we were in that situation when that person came by or said this or said that, that luck magically made it all happen. Okay. Let's keep going, Bob. Next for us, number 10 on this our, our list. This is our last one, right? No, because uh, I'm not doing it. I won't <laughs> okay. stop there. Amateurs focus on the short term. Professionals focus on the long term. We see this in sales all the time, Chad, right? Like that, that amateur salesperson, that they're just focused on that next commission, that next sale, that, and they will, man, I, I see this every single day. They will step over dollars that are nine months down the road to try to pick up 50 cents today they're right. just constantly and so like professionals understand like i'm building a, a pipeline here right like as at least as it relates to sales right i'm building a pipeline where that that amateur is just trying to find that deal today and they will literally ignore responses from from prospects that don't have the words in them that say I'm a deal today, but but the words indicate I'm a deal in six months or nine months or twelve months. So I mean, this is a this is a really big one. I think that especially in sales, like that that focus on the long term. And we we were kicking this back and forth, Chad, and you know, because Ben does have this philosophy. We don't really plan around here for like a year from now right. because we don't know what the the environment's going to be in a year, and so. You know, we tend to have shorter planning sprints, you know, three months, for example. Yeah. And, and in more stable times, we'll open those up a little bit. Um, so e even, you know, I don't think that Ben's, you know, desire to focus on a three-month time frame makes him an amateur by any means, right? He just, you know, again, most, most people are focusing on like, what am I going to get done today? How, how am I going to move my business forward today? And there has to be some you know, component of looking at it at a little bit longer time frame. Doesn't always have to be a year out or five years out, right? But it does, there does have to be some focus on, you know, a, a longer term. And look, that, that gets to things like process that we've already talked about, right? Having a process. Um, yeah. Yep. Here's, look, we've talked about it a lot, right? Ben always says we don't plan long. Doesn't mean there isn't a vision. 
doesn't mean that he doesn't have that professionals have that long term, right? That he's going to build. I mean, we talk, how many times have we talked about if you knew Ben back when, when he was really just getting started with, with opening his, his, his team in the real estate industry, that he still had that diagram on the wall over his bed that talked about that he would have a tech company one day and he would have this and he would have that and had all these pieces came together. He had the long term focus. Yeah. He just doesn't plan specifically on when that long term focus will happen. And I think when I hear this one of amateurs focus on the short term and professionals focus on the long term, I think amateurs short term literally means the day. Like, I don't think amateurs can see, you know, in front of their face when it comes to that. That's the player who goes out there and the only thing that matters in the game is that I win today, right? We, I, I catch the ball, I win the game, I get the hit, whatever that's going to be. Whereas professionals are, you know what? As long as we win the Super Bowl, no one's going to remember what happened in game two, right? As long as we win the World Series, no one remembers the at-bat I had on June 4th, you know, whatever that's going to be. Amateurs, it's that day, it's so short. And in that regard, 90 days is huge, compared to one if you thought about the short term versus the long term yeah I, I i really like this last one we considered cutting this but i think we kind of left this one because we wanted to have 11 and so and before last, you do it i'm yeah. going to recap where we are for the, those of us who uh love doing that because i know they all sit there and go chad recap the list for me right because i missed one or something all right amateurs stop when they achieve something professionals understand that it was just the initial achievement being the beginning amateurs have a goal professionals have a process then we had uh, amateurs see feedback and coaching as someone criticizing them as a person professionals know they just have weak spots and seek out thoughtful criticism amateurs value isolated performance amateurs give up at the first sign of trouble and assume their failures where professionals see failures as part of a path to growth and mastery amateurs have no idea what improves the odds of achieving great outcomes professionals do Amateurs focus on identifying their weaknesses and improving them. Professionals focus on their strengths and leveraging their weaknesses. Amateurs focus on being right. Professionals focus on getting the best outcome. Amateurs think good outcomes are because they're brilliant. Professionals understand when outcomes are the result of luck. And amateurs focus on the short term. Professionals focus on the long term. And Bob, like you said, I got a thing against top five and top 10 lists. So we have number 11, which is? Amateurs believe the world should work the way they want it to. Professionals realize that they have to work with the world as they find it. And Chad, having been somebody that's been on the other side of a couple of different software companies over the years, I would say this is mega true. Um, yep. you, you know, look, I, and I've, I've probably, like, in, against my better judgment, at some point said to somebody, that's really crazy. I don't know how the other 5,000 people that use this exact same software figure this out. Um, you know, like, look, software especially, there's, you can always make it better and you always are. And, but, like, like, the thing you have today is, is the way it works today, right? Like, yeah. the, the opportunity you have is the opportunity. Sure, we we wish it was different. We wish it was easier. We wish it was, you know, we wish in real estate right now more people were buying and selling houses. Like professionals realize that I got to go to work with the way things are. Um, and and you know that's that mindset. I don't know, by the way, if you can how easy it is to change that mindset, Chad. That's like the it's the victim's mindset. Right. It oh, this really isn't, is. This isn't going to work for me. This, this, oh, this. If this thing was perfect, then I'd do it. Right. It's, it's given myself a whole bunch of reasons of why I can't do it, and the professional just goes, "This is the playing field. I'm going to make it happen." You know, and uh, you can change your mindset on it because I'm an example of it. I was an amateur when it came to taxes. Mm so many years, right? I wanted to work the way that I wanted it to. I, you know, I don't want to pay you now. I want to do, I, I shouldn't have to do it this way. I should do it this way. Change how this all works for me. And then we become professionals and realize, ah, here's the tax code. And as Tom Wheelwright says, right, the first two pages are how to actually pay your taxes. And the other 6,000 pages are ways to avoid actually paying taxes and doing it yourself and getting all these rebate and things. That's the professional's way of saying, okay, I got the rule book I'm going to figure this out now, uh, which is something we've done. And we're in a situation, 
just today, Nita and I are, are working on, on something. I'm not ready to talk about what it is yet. We're working on something. Um, and we both looked at each other with, ah, that's just so stupid that it's done that way. Right. And we, and we're like, wait, okay, this is the way it works. We've got to figure out how we play the game within those rules. So yeah. it happens all the time. And folks, you can change any of these. You can go from amateur to professional. You don't need a big contract. You don't need Nike to sign you to some deal. All you have to do is make the commitment and say, I'm no longer going to act like that amateur. I'm going to act. Wait, like if you needed a coach, coach, reach out to Chad. He'll beat up on you all day. Well, thank you, Bob. I appreciate the plug. <laughs> I gave one to Brian. You gave one to me. They can find me in the Facebook group if they actually do want to find me. Just direct message me. So, folks, look, amateur versus professional, the choice is yours. We really hope you choose professional. We really love that you keep choosing win, make, give. And because of it, we're going to keep bringing you some amazing stuff that Bob and I have laid out for season four. We are so excited to what is ahead. We hope you'll share this episode with that amateur that you're giving that push to, to become the professional. So share the episodes, join us in our Facebook group. And until our next episode, as always, do good. Do good.